Welcome to a cult of personality, esoteric podcast extraordinaire. I'm your host, Greg Kaminsky, and Billy Hepper is your co-host. Now, in episode number 215, we're joined by the one and only John Michael Greer, one of the most excellent and prolific writers around, not only with his occult books and blogs, but also his extensive writings on ecology and civilizational decline. We get into all of it in this extensive interview, which is an important and timely conversation, but especially the second half. I've personally found that John Michael Greer's occult writings are very accurate and reliable, and that following the recommendations in his non-occult writings are life-saving, so it is a joy to be able to share this interview with you. You can find John Michael Greer online at www.ecosophia.net and ecosophia.dreamwidth.org. A Cult of Personality podcast is made possible by you, the listeners, and by the subscribers to ChamberOfReflection.com, our membership website, who aids us in the cause of informed, authentic, and accessible interviews about Western esotericism. Thank you again. Because of your support, we're able to bring you recordings of this caliber and many more to come. Anathema Publishing Limited Quality Occult Books and Contemporary Esoterica Established in 2011, Anathema Publishing aims to provide superior literature in content and form by creating a trinosophic relationship in troth and gabo between publisher, author, and reader. Anathema Publishing produces refined books for the true bibliophile on topics ranging from Gnosticism, traditional craft, alchemy, hermeticism, witchcraft, to Luciferian theosophy. www.anathemapublishing.com The intro music is Awakening by Paul Abgerinos, and the outro music is New Welcome Summer by Shira Kamen. Hello. Hello, welcome. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure to be on again. Oh, it's a pleasure to have you. Uh, uh, Yeah, it's really, we're we're both big fans of yours. So Yes, um, indeed. We're really, really looking forward to speaking with you this afternoon. So thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. Not not a problem at all. I appreciate being on podcasts. They're basically it's free advertising, advertising for me and my books. So you know what's not to like. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so and we enjoy speaking with you and hearing your opinions. <laughs> so it works out for everyone. <laughs> Excuse me, my weird opinions. Please let's get this. <laughs> let's get the adjective where it belongs. <laughs> well, if your opinions are weird, I'm sure that makes me. Yeah, we're weird, right there. Weird with you. as well. You know. I mean, this is, there, there's a lot of us weirdos out there. So. There are, <laughs> thankfully. <laughs> okay. Um. So I think the recording is actually already going. So. We oh can... yeah, it. I, I heard the little the chirpy little voice saying, um, "This meeting is being recorded." Good. So I, I presume that it would, that it was not just making things up or fibbing mm. to make us feel better. No, no. I just want to make sure. So we're we're oh, yeah. good to go. So. We're rolling. Okay. All right. So, uh, Billy, I think is going to lead it off with our first question, unless you have anything you want to say no. before we begin. No, nope. I'm ready to roll. All right. Thank you. Perfect. John, when I was preparing for the show today, I was blown away, frankly, with just how much material you've written over the years. I think I searched your name in, in Amazon and I got something like eight pages of, of search results. So that, that'd be about right. Yeah. Yeah. You've just been a incredibly prolific writer. Um, writing books on everything from, you know, classical alchemy to Lovecraftian fiction to uh, Druidism. So I even found a, a few of your books in my personal collection from back oh, in the day. Um, your what a concept, encycl- yeah. Yeah. <laughs> your Encyclopedia of Secret Societies, which I absolutely mm-hmm. loved, um, especially I'm when I was like yeah, first getting into Freemasonry. So mm-hmm. I have to ask, um, how have you managed to just write so many books and, and not only quantity, but quality as well? 
you are widely <laughs> accepted as a go-to expert on many of these topics. How do you do it? Well, the, the, there's the, there's this sort of um, a quick, simple, um, and not, but not entirely inaccurate thing. I don't have a television. Hmm. Hmm. Um, most people spend four to six hours a day on the tube. And yeah. that's time that you could be putting into like having a life and doing things like that. And um, I, I, television bores me; it always has. And so um, I don't have one, and so I have that extra chunk of time. Of course, um, since I w- once I reached the point that I could support myself with my writing, that made it a lot easier. <laughs> yeah. Not having not having a full not having a job plus commute that I had to worry about, um, but the, basically, I mean, all of that's kind of kind of glib and easy. I I read enormous amounts. That's I enjoy doing that. I write uh, because I enjoy writing. Um, I live a fairly quiet life. Almost, I suppose some people would call it secluded. I'm not. I'm not enormously social. I'm not, I don't spend all my time in batting room, you know, batting around at parties or what have you. Um, and that's just that's a matter of my personality. And I do have there's a lot of things I like to I like to read about. I like to study and practice and talk about. And books are my way of doing it. I suppose it's it's my substitute for a busy social life is you know sit down at the keyboard. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as someone who hermits pretty regularly myself, I can definitely mm-hmm. relate to that. I I never seem to run out of projects to work on. You know, you should, well, that's just it. Yeah, that's just it. People, people go. Well, where did you get all? Where do you get all your ideas? Uh, Harlan Ellison used to have a great line. People would ask where he got his ideas from for science, his science fiction stories, and he would always say, "There's a little lady in, I think it was uh, Schenectady, who would put a bunch every, you know, every every Friday she would put a bunch of ideas into a Manila envelope, and mail into him. <laughs> <laughs> Typical Harlan, um, but." The thing is, I have I have more ideas for books than I will ever be able to finish. Um, more subjects I want to learn about, more stories I want to tell, more um, arguments, you know, quarrels I want to pick with thinkers of the past and present. Um, yeah, I, that's not that's never a problem. It's purely a matter of you know there only being so many hours in a day. Well, that's great. Um, similarly to Billy. Uh, one of your my favorite books of yours over the years has always been that Encyclopedia of Secret Societies, and I mm-hmm. would go back to it regularly. Mm-hmm. I'm wondering if you could just give us a glimpse of what it was like to research and write that book, and if there were any oh, was, groups that stand out in your memory. It was enormous fun. It wasn't my idea. Um, what happened was that um, the the publisher. Um, Harper Collins had somebody lined up. They have a whole they had a whole series of encyclopedias. I don't know if they're still out there, but they had this whole series of encyclopedias. They had somebody lined out lined up to write an encyclopedia of conspiracies and secret societies, and then their intended writer flubbed out on them and left them with almost no time. And they needed to get someone in a hurry. And the editor went down to the local bookstore. Because publishers do this and saw a copy of my book inside a magical lodge sitting right next to a copy of my book, the new encyclopedia of the occult. So she contacted me out of the blue. This is very convenient. Uh, so I kind of needed a, a, a big, a big royalty, you know, a big advance kind of project at the time. And um, so I agreed to do it, even though it was a fairly quick um, turnaround. I had to get a lot of information in a hurry. But that was right after the peak of my involvement in uh, fraternal and magical lodges. And um, that, you know, that, that was that was shortly after the period when late in when I was living in Seattle, when I was at like twelve or thirteen meetings a month that I was going to. Wow. Between the various fraternal lodges, between the various uh, magical lodges I was involved in, and all that, and so, and I'd been I'd been researching this, I'd been reading all this stuff, so I had most of the information at my fingertips, and it was just a matter of, of putting it all down. Um, but it was enormous fun, and the, I mean, there were the, there there's, there was a lot of stuff about the serious groups, about the, the Masons, of course, about the. Um, you know the the non masonic fraternal lodges like the independent order of odd fellows and the grange about um some of the serious magical groups like the golden dawn and all that was great but i was also able to find some books on some of the and some some other information on some of the silly lodges that have existed <laughs> and i think that's you know that that was that was half the, the the value of the whole thing just remembering that the whole lodge thing can be used very seriously or it can be used for fun, ask any Shriner. Um, but where you have organizations like the Concatenated Order of Hoo Hoo, or, um, you know. 
<laughs> just that 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 exists. You know, the the um, the main um, the officers, if I recall correctly, of a of a lodge of the concatenator who concatenator of who who are the um, let's see, I believe there's the snark, the senior boojum, and the junior boojum. They take all the stuff from the hunting of the snark. You see. Oh. Okay. <laughs> it's it's fun. It's fun and and. Um, but yeah, so there was there was a lot of amusement value, a lot of interesting little bits of trivia, and I, encyclopedias are fun to write. You don't have to work out an argument; you just have to gather information and, and make it make it readable. And so the, I, I I I put in sixteen hour days on that thing because I had such a short turnaround, so it's all kind of a blur. But I got it into them on on time. Well, it was great fun to read as well. Mm-hmm. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, just staying on that topic, I think it's safe that all three of us here today and, and most of our listeners, I think, share a healthy fascination with all things related to secret societies and fraternal, mm-hmm. fraternal orders and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. So one of your honorable titles, which I'm rather envious of, is uh, Grand Archdruid of the Ancient Order of Druids in America. Yeah. Technically speaking, I'm an Archdruid Emeritus now. I, I, ah. I put in my 12 years as Grand Archdruid. Okay, that was and, my mistake. Um, that was, that, I, I had a grand time. Um, that that was. I mean, how did you? You were going to ask, I think, how that happened and how yeah. that, that. Okay, this is one of those things. If I tried to put this in a novel, nobody would believe it. So I got involved in Druid by way, by way of some people I knew in the Druid scene in Seattle. They brought me into the Order of Bards, Ovates, and Druids, which is the largest Druid order in the world today. And I did the correspondence course, and I celebrated the rituals with that group. And having finished the correspondence course in my 2001, I was going, wow, this is so cool. I want to learn more. I'm going to join. I'm going to find some other Druid orders. I'm going to find at least one more and join it and do its, its training and learn all about it. And so I, I've managed to find an old book, uh, old meaning at this point from the 1980s, on American Druid groups that mentioned um, something called the Ancient Order of Druids in America. And the author of this book on, on Druid Orders did not think much of them. He thought they were, you know, too old-fashioned and too stuffy, and the worst word in his vocabulary, Masonic. So I knew instantly that I'd love it. <laughs> the problem was that the contact information was years out of date. So I made some inquiries, and I sent off some um, sent off some letters, and the, the, you know, the internet was around in those days. This, this is not quite back when dinosaurs roamed the earth. So, but I finally, I did, long story short, it turned out that I actually knew the guy who was the secretary of the little surviving body of, of the members of the order. Um, he didn't know I was interested. I didn't know he was involved. I knew him through the American Taro Association. But we finally, that finally got sorted out, and. It turned out that the AODA at that point was about 11 people, and I was the young, I, you know, when I applied to join, I was the youngest by 30 years. Oh. And so we went through this series of conversations, by email, mostly by email and phone, where I started saying, wow, I, I, I'm, a, I'm interested in this. I've learned something about Druid. I'd love to learn what the AODA has to teach, and, you know, are you willing to teach it? And it went from there to me going, wow. This is great. Have you considered blowing the dust off this and like getting it out there in public again and like, bringing in new members? And then it went from there to, you want me to run it? <laughs> and that's what happened. They they decided, you know, they knew that I was I'd been involved in magical lodges and fraternal lodges. I'd been the the um, chief patriarch or the the grand patriarch of the Grand Encampment of Washington, the Odd Fellows. So I had some administrative experience mm. in running in running a fraternal body, and so they brought me in and um, plopped me into the. Um, I was archer to the east for all of three months, and then the grand arch, the then grand archdruid, um, was suffering. She was having health problems, and nobody else really wanted to step up to the plate. So I, have, on three months of experience, I became grand archdruid of the Grand Grove of the Ancient Order of Druids in America. Marvelous title. That and 350 will get you a cup of coffee because it was the order was basically defunct. So I proceeded to spend the next 12 years of my life, you know, slapping shock, shock paddles on the chest of a, of a prostrate order and zapping it over and over again and getting it on its feet. It was fun. It was an enormous amount of work. And when I finally got to the point, okay, we're good. I can step back from this, handed things over to my successor and breathed an immense sigh of relief. That happened in 2015. It's fascinating. So is the order based on a sort of an initiatic structure like Freemasonry? Like do you have degrees? Oh, yeah. and that sort of yeah, thing? Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, there, yeah, there are three. It's, 
<clears throat> the okay, the relationship to Freemasonry here is 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 complex. We're pretty sure that what happened was because the the okay, AODA had its original charter from an outfit in England. Um, the Ancient and Archaeological Order of Druids. I love that name. Um, and the AAOD was founded by um, Robert Wentworth Little, the same Robert Wentworth Little who was responsible for the Masonic Rosicrucian body, the SRI Anglia. Um, yeah, oh, he was a he was a heavy duty Freemason. And yet, when I went to England and had a chance to to like look up, up what they had in the Grand Lodge archives there in the United Grand Lodge of England, um, there was a gaping, echoing silence about that whole end of Little's activities. Now, you may know that a lot of people back then were of the opinion that um, Masonry was actually descended from the ancient Druids. Right. Yes. Yeah, it's one of these. It, it, it wasn't as far as we can tell, but a lot of people believe that. I'm fairly sure that what happened was that Little reworked the, Mason, the three Masonic degrees to make them fit um, his idea of what the ancient Druids. And so it was this, frankly, very clandestine sort of operation, at least because it admitted women. And so, but so it came to America, and there was some revision to the ritual. And then Juliet Ashley, the third Grand Arch Druid, got going, and she was she was a fireball. She studied with Carl Jung. Um, she had some kind of connection with Arthur Edward Waite. She completely rewrote the rituals. And by the time they got to me, there were just a few little scraps of Freemasonry here and there tucked into the rituals, and I. I discussed that with the old guard, and they said, yeah, we probably better let go of that so nobody has to break their oaths. So we cleaned everything up, and there is nothing currently Masonic in the AODA rituals. There are still three degrees, hmm. but they're not the same three degrees at all as the, as the ones that, uh, you know, that I, for example, that I encountered as as a Mason, and that I've, I've subsequently encountered the several other jurisdiction, Masonic jurisdictions where I, where I belonged. That's fascinating. Thank you very much. John, I'm a big, big fan of your writings on the topic of collapse, and I'm wondering mm -hmm. if you can characterize our current state in regard to collapse, where we're headed in the near term, mm -hmm. and how it's possible to collapse early and get it out of the way. <laughs> my, my, my standard buzz, my, my standard catchphrase here is collapse now and avoid the rush. Um, I, I always tend to back away a little bit from that term collapse because people tend to think of it in Hollywood terms. You know, you go to bed one night in a perfectly functioning industrial society, you wake up and suddenly you're in a cave <laughs> with a bear skin, with a, with a bear skin over you. And, you know, here's your spear. Now go get some food. Um, <laughs> People have this drastic idea of how fast a society can decline. That's one of the reasons why I've tended to use the term decline, partly because it reminds people this is a long, ragged process, and partly because it freaks people out far more than collapse does. Um, people can, even, even people who believe devoutly in uh, what I've called the religion of progress, the, the conviction that progress is hired, hardwired into history, that it must be onward and upward, we're going to go to the stars no matter what, blah, blah, blah. Um, they can get their minds around collapse, but suggest, no, actually, we've peaked and we're on the way down. And they start gibbering. It's really quite remarkable. So the, the first thing to know, I, I would encourage all of our listeners to know, is just, you know, go outside. Think back to a decade ago or two decades ago or three decades ago, however long your memories reach, and notice what's changed and in what direction. Yes, we have um, a few fancy toys like iPhones and things like that. I, I get that. Look at the condition of the roads. Look at the condition of the houses and the other buildings. Look at the condition of the economy. Look at the condition of um, the people who keep the economy going, the working classes. I mean, when I was a, one of my one of the things I point out routinely, when I was a child, um, you could support a family of four on one working class income in the United States and own and be able to afford a home, um, a car, three square meals a day, medical care, all this stuff, on one working class salary. Nowadays, a family of four on one working class salary is probably on the street. There has been an immense decline that nobody wants to talk about. And so the first thing that I want everyone to realize here is that when we're talking about decline, we're not talking about something that's going to happen. It's something that's been happening since about 1970. And the fact that we have some of these 
caught in new technologies is, is a distraction, sure. And it's also very typical. The technology routinely improves while the society is going down. There's kind of a lag time effect. Um, so on the one hand, yeah, you need to think of it in terms of this, this, prog- this process of decline, this ragged downward um, you know, lurch and stumble that we've all been involved in for the last half century and more. The second thing is that um, the way to get ahead of the curve is to collapse faster than society is. That's why collapse now and avoid the rush. I hear constantly from people who are saying, well, you know, I understand that it would, I, I, I need to get like some money to, do, to learn some new skills. I need to do all these various things to get ready for life in a, in a less technical, technologically advanced era, to get, ready, get, get prepared for life as the internet starts becoming unreliable and so on and so forth. And they say, well, how can I do that? And the answer is very simply, collapse now. Start living now as though, you, as though it had already happened. Start taking some of the money you're spending on all of these, all this high-tech gimmickry and so on, and save it instead and use that to get the training you need. So, um, of course, throw out your TV. Uh, do that. Do that first and foremost. I mean, that that will that will give you not only time but clarity of thought, and then put that time to good use, and so on and so forth. If you get ahead of the curve, that gives you that extra the extra time, the extra resources, the extra money, and the extra flexibility that will allow you to prepare for the various steps down as we take them. Thank you. Yeah. It- just taking in everything that what you said, John, um, it reminds me of one essay in particular that you wrote um, titled How Civilizations Fall, um, mm-hmm. where you kind of chart the rise and fall of these various empires in oh, human history. Okay, yeah. good. You've actually, you've actually read the Catabolic Collapse paper. Not many people I, have. Yeah, yeah I, I really enjoyed it. And, I'm glad to you know, hear it. You, you talk about the Roman Empire, the Mayan empires who you know, mm-hmm. eventually fall victim to their excessive dependency on natural resources and mm-hmm. become overburdened and unwieldy and eventually collapse. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I think we're, we're seeing that now, like you said, the, the fault lines, the, oh, yeah. crack, the cracks are showing in the great empire of the United States. Um, mm-hmm. But something that you mentioned is, you know, in the shadow of these fallen empires, you see the rise of what you call micro society, the, these kind of... Mm-hmm small independent communities that are based around yeah. agri- agricultural centers. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess my question is, is, is there hope, do you think, for these oh, good small... Heavens, yes. One of, one of the things about decline is that it means that anyone who's willing and able to adapt can adapt. Um, one of the things that is often forgotten is that, for example, when the Roman Empire collapsed, when it went down its long, ragged process of decline, rather... Um, that actually improved the life of many people who were living in the Roman Empire at that time. Because, you know, you have this immense, unwieldy imperial system, you have these gargantuan bureaucracies, you have crushing taxes, you have everything regulated to death into a sort of, this sort of late civilizational rigor mortis that is so common in the twilight years of civilization. All of this adds to the burden of, of you know, things that can't be sustained. And it drives the society into this, this sequence of crises that eventually cause it to fall apart completely. And as it goes to pieces, people walk away. And people just turn their backs on the failing system, and they find ways to make a living that are outside the, you know, the, the, the dis- completely dysfunctional structures. We're seeing that right now. There's been a lot of talk about the, quote, great resignation about some millions of people who have literally walked away from work during the shutdowns when so many working class jobs were just cut off, laid off, you know, and so many people were were left to work from home. An enormous number of people seem to have realized, hold it, the rat race is not the only option. The working for some sleazy corporation for whatever, um, you know, miserable hours and pathetic rate of pay and abusive managerial practices, they want to, this is not the only choice. And so, in, in, you know, some millions of people said, I, there are other ways to make a living. I know quite a few people, actually, who are working under the table. They are, you know, they are providing goods and services to other individuals. They are not looking for an employer to mediate their labor. They're just working for people. They're doing fine. 
Um, and so as that picks up, as various other workarounds pick up, you're seeing people doing exactly what folks did in the late Roman period, you just shrug and roll their eyes and walk away from a failing civilization. Thank you. John, when I read some of your writings, or many of them, I, I come away with the sense that your love of nature and love of magic are not two. And you convey the knowing of this subtly, but mm -hmm. undeniably. And I'm wondering if you can talk about how love, nature, and magic come together to shape one's mm -hmm. entire existence. Okay. Um, surprisingly enough, yes, I can talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Well, to begin with, um, the idea that there is this thing called nature that is separate from human existence, you know, nicely ghettoized off in parks or something, is a delusion. Nature is the real world. The worlds that we live in in our heads, the worlds of concepts, the worlds of ideologies, the worlds of, of technological gimmickry, um, these things are fantasies. They are unreal. And so people kind of pull themselves away from the real world of nature to inhabit these, these bizarre fantasy lands. And that's, you know, that's part of human free will. That's part of our capacity as, as a very creative species. But I'm not sure it's necessarily being used in a constructive fashion here. And so one of the things that people give up in the course of buying into the ideologies, buying into the technologies and the gimmicks in the worldview, is they lose track of the fact of the ways in which the human mind, human consciousness shapes its own experience. That's the basics of, basis of magic. Mm -hmm. I mean, magic is not the crap you see in Hollywood. It is not special effects. It, you know, Dion Fortune's definition is great. Magic is the art and science of causing change in consciousness in accordance with will. That's a sneaky definition because it doesn't define whose consciousness is being changed, nor does it define whose will. Um, a Christian mystic who is trying to attune his or her will to, to the will of God is practicing magic by that definition. And, of course, Fortune knew that perfectly well. She was herself a, a strange but very devout Christian. Yeah. Um, and so the whole idea is that consciousness is the reality that mediates all of this to us. We, we know about the world because we're conscious of it. We experience it through our consciousness. We can change. We can change how we encounter the world, and we can ch change to some extent how the world encounters us by, by changing our consciousness, by changing the consciousness of other beings. So there's this world of magic which is all tied into our relationship with reality. But the imaginary world that so many people live in, a world that's defined by ideologies, that's defined by the, 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 the bizarre fantasy world portrayed by the media, that's designed by the incredibly limited experiences you can get from, from technological media and so on, um, that world has no, room, has no room for magic. That room has no world for, no, that, that world, try that again, that, room, that world has no room for consciousness. It has no place for people to be anything other than consumers, to sit there and you know, pay money to get a sleazy corporate shit, excuse my language, um, that isn't worth a, a moment of their time or, you know, or energy. Um, and so when you start paying attention to what's actually real, if you start paying attention to your conscious experience, if you start paying attention to nature and the ways that nature shapes your life right now, even if you're sitting inside a you know a, a, a condo somewhere, you, I mean your body is nature. When you start doing that, you then have you have a choice. You can approach this with um, kind of manipulative consciousness. You can say, "Oh, what can I get out of this?" And that's a very common. Or you can approach it with love. You can approach it uh, with an eye toward relationship. And that's a choice every human soul has to make. It's not something that, that is made for us. And a lot depends on it. Um, the front philosopher Martin Buber wrote a fascinating book called I and Thou, where he, uh, well, it's, that's kind of a garbo, kind of an awkward way of translating the German phrasing, but I would say I and you would be better. And he talks about the difference between relating to the world as an it and relating to the world as a you. You relate to the world as a thing that you can manipulate? Or do you relate to it as a being or a collection of beings with whom you can have interactions, with whom you can have a relationship? And 
the I it consciousness is very popular in our world today. People are people are deeply into that. They think they can get what they want from from the universe by treating it as a vending machine in one way or another, and it ultimately lives, leads into misery <laughs> and, and misery and failure. And the I you relationship, treating the universe as a you, as a person or a, or a collection of people, um, it's more difficult. It's much less popular. It requires you to put your ego on the shelf and maybe not spend so much time polishing and dusting it. But it leads to joy. It leads to love. And so, you know, that's the choice, is to borrow a phrase from, from a bad science fiction novel of my childhood. Uh, you know, which will you have? The love of power or the power of love? Take your pick. That's beautiful. Thank you so much. I 100% well, agree you. with everything you said there. You're welcome, and thank you. Just to switch gears a little bit here, if you don't mind, John, um, you posted fairly recently um, on your website, egosophia.net, about a organization that I was unfamiliar with known as the Octagon Society. Um, oh, yeah. Which, yeah, I found really interesting. I was fascinated by the stories of the formation of the society, the rather colorful origin stories about its links to the <laughs> Knights Templar and that sort of thing. Um, uh -huh. Can you tell us just a little bit about how you were introduced to this society and well, sure. well, your decision you to... Already, you yeah. You already know most of the story because all of this. What what happened? Okay, we. I talked about John Gilbert. I talk about the the guy who brought me into the ancient order of druids in America. Okay, that John Gilbert was the guy that I contacted with the, the American Torah Association. Um, he was the last man standing, uh, pretty much, of an entire world of little occult organizations and magical lodges that had been running around um, the Boulder, Colorado area um, up until the mid twentieth century. He got involved in that in in several of them as they were in the process of basically folding into each other. Because you've got to remember that after the Second World War, on the one hand, a lot of people were not interested in the, the occultism that had been so popular in the, between the wars and so on. On the other hand, a lot of people were very much into things like Wicca as much as anything else because of the sex. <laughs> and, you know, the idea of taking your clothes off and dancing in a circle in the 1950s especially had a lot of appeal. In the 60s, of course, it was losing some of its charm simply because people did that a lot anyway. <laughs> and so, but there, there was this real tendency to look for the sort of avant-garde, now dancing naked in a circle, um, you know, doing drugs, all, all of that sort of counterculture vibe, which Wicca, American Wicca, really had. And these old-fashioned orders did not. And so you had a whole series of orders in, in, in many parts of the country, of course, where it was all, they were all part of one magical community, and they all shared members. And as the membership shrank, they all kind of drew together until you ended up by about 1970 or so, when, when John Gilbert got involved in, in the AODA and some of these other orders. Um, it was all the same people. You know, they'd go to a Druid meeting on Tuesday, and they'd go to the um, the Golden Dawn offshoot on Thursday, and there'd be the Gnostic Church on Sunday, and so on. Um, and it was all the same folks. And so when I became a member of AODA, when I was brought in, um, one of the things that was done at that point, and I, I re actually received the transmission a year, a year later, in the summer of, of 2004, um, where John, the first time John and I, well, the second time actually John and I actually met, we were actually in the same place, but um, I was initiated into each of these other organizations, into the, the Order of Spiritual Alchemy, of which the Octagon Society is, is the first level, into his off, the, the Holy Order of the Golden Dawn, um, which does not have much to do with the Hermetic Order that we all know about. Um, that's something that I'm discussing right now on my blog. The modern order of Essenes and the Universal Gnostic Church. So over the course of a weekend, I went through a whole series of initiations and consecrations, and found myself suddenly, you know, loaded down with the with quite a quite a slew of improbable titles, <laughs> and you know, among those that of a Gnostic bishop, and um, the the Order of Spiritual Alchemy was one of those. Um, the actual origins are probably late 19th century America coming out of the New Thought movement and so on, but it was, it was standard in those days to have the, the romantic origin story going back to the Knights Templar. Was there possibly some connection? I have no idea. I wasn't there. <laughs> and, but, but the Order of Spiritual Alchemy, 
and the Octagon Society, especially as its, as its first level, it has a lot of really good stuff in it. It is specifically psychological alchemy, emotional alchemy. Mm-hmm. Um, the goal is to unpack unpack your psyche, do the kind of thing that people used to pay a lot of money to shrinks for, but do it yourself using a notebook, just sitting on the couch, and get down to the root of your problems, get down to the root of your hang-ups and your emotional burdens, and release some of that stuff. And so, you know, it's, it, I, I went through, the, you know, having received all these things, I figured, okay, I better do the training now. Mm-hmm. It's kind of the wrong way around, but, the, but I did it. And I found in particular the OSA work to be extremely useful to me to sort of clear away a lot of the, a lot of the legacy of a not very happy childhood and so on. So that has actually that, that that story actually has a happy ending because at this you know I started putting material from the Octagon Society onto um, onto my Dreamwith journal, Ecosophia um, dot Dreamwith dot org, and um, people got interested in it and people started doing the exercises and so on, and at this point we're in the final stage of relaunching the Order of Spiritual Alchemy as an independent um, esoteric body. So oh. probably within three months or so, um, the website will be up and uh, it'll be open for membership and anyone who wants to can get the initial stuff to start learning. That's fantastic. So, yeah, so yeah. that's that, that's that, that's really pleasing. Right now I'm in the process of doing the same thing with, with John's Golden Dawn organization. I've had to make some changes because, of course, some aspects of it, like the, the passwords and, and signs of the degrees and so on, those were earthbound. They were not the same as the ones from that everyone knows from Regardi's books and so on. And so I had, so I, I made, took obligations, of course, not to reveal the, the word and the sign and this kind of stuff. So I've had to come up with new words, new signs, a little new symbolism here and there. Same techniques, same practices. Um, the Fellowship of the Hermetic Rose is now um, currently being, um, well, I'm putting up papers about a week at a time on my Dream with Journal for anybody to practice. I'm going to go through the whole, the whole system and just have it out there. After that, probably next is going to be the modern order of Essenes, same process. And after that, I have to tackle the Universal Gnostic Church, which is going to be a bear. There's a lot of material. Well, I applaud your decision to release these materials publicly. I think, yeah. especially with the o, the OSA work, I think um, yeah. you know they're they're just so practical these exercises that I think anybody yeah. could find benefit in them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The, the, the thing is, after John passed away, after John Gilbert passed away last year. Um, I really felt that this stuff was too valuable to be left to just to molder. And so I've decided, you know, since I, I talked to his widow and I talked to some of the other people who had been involved and everyone was cool with the idea of getting these things into circulation again. And so I stepped up to the plate. It's great. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. You deserve yeah. a lot of credit for, for doing that. Yeah. Certainly. It's, just, it's, it's, it's one of the, it's one of those things that occultists do. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> um, both Billy and I are Freemasons, and obviously mm-hmm. yes, indeed you are as well. And I'm wondering if you can talk a bit about how Freemasonry has affected your spiritual path, your impression of Freemasonry as an institution, and and its mm-hmm. value for for others. Mm-hmm. Well, I, can't, I should I should start by saying I came into Freemasonry kind of the long way around. Um, I originally got involved in the golden back in my teen years in the Golden Dawn tradition of ceremonial magic, and that ended up developing an interest in lodge organizations, kind of to try to understand what all what's going on in these initiation rituals that I was reading about. And I ended up finding out by the usual chapter accidents that my grandfather, my great grandfather rather, had been a member of the Independent Order of Odd Fellows, mm-hmm. and I discovered this and mentioned the fact to my wife, and she said, oh, I just read in the paper, they have a lodge here in Seattle, we were living in Seattle at the time, that's looking for new members. And so I took the, I took the hint. And so I joined the Odd Fellows. And shortly thereafter, the two of us, my wife and I, both joined the Grange. And it was by way of people we knew in the Odd Fellows and in the Grange that I decided, okay, time to, time to petition a Masonic Lodge. And it was... The, where we lived at the apartment where we lived at that time was like equidistant between four Masonic lodges. So I more or less chose which one had a convenient meeting night. <laughs> Seattle's well stocked with Masonic lodges. Yes, and so I, so I was entered past and raised um, in Doric Lodge number 92 in Seattle. And um, 
um, it was an interesting experience because on the one hand, of course, I'd had previous exposure to initiation rituals. And although the Masonic rituals are, are certainly different, it's a difference of degree rather than a difference of kind. Um, once you know the basic lodge ritual format, you kind of know what's going on. And so at the time I was going, this is kind of interesting. This is, this is an interesting new lodge ritual. It wasn't until a couple of relocations later when I got involved in the York Rite. I had previously done the Scottish Rite degrees and found them very interesting, but kind of abstract because, you know, there you are sitting on sitting in an auditorium watching people doing a degree. It's like a theatrical performance, and it doesn't – there were ways in which it really didn't connect. You can tell that um, the Scottish – I mean, the Scottish Rite was, frankly, very badly affected by the the um, – the, the the influence of and, and the unintended influence of the shrine. Many 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 people joined the Scottish Rite just so they could go through, um, you know, a weekend an intensive weekend of ritual, and then they they just maintained their Scottish Rite membership because they wanted to golf at the shrine golf course. They wanted to be involved in the shrine, and so the Scottish Rite um, simplified their degrees, and it became very very much this sort of rote process. And I think it really hurt the Rite considerably to go through that. Um, but I got involved in the York Rite after we moved to Maryland. I was in a small town in western Maryland, and they had a thriving Masonic scene there. But the York Rite had kind of fallen on hard times. Um, a couple of the old guys asked me to join and encouraged a bunch of us to join. I got involved and ended up um, holding down the chairs and doing the big chair in you know, all three branches and doing a lot of other activities. And, and doing a lot of degree work. And there's a lot of depth in masonry that I had simply not noticed the first time around. And it's easy to miss in Blue Lodge. It's easy to miss in those first three degrees mm-hmm. because so many, so many lodges, it's being, done, uh, it's being done by rote. It's being done as a formality. You do meet um, brothers who take it seriously as a spiritual thing. But not too many of them. I don't know, at least I have not met that many of them in the in the four states where I've been active, and so it becomes it can become very arbitrary. I think masonry has enormous potential. I think there's an enormous amount of possibility in in getting back to the spiritual dimension of the traditions and of the teachings and of the rituals. But it's going to take some some hard work and. It's going to take some tolerance on the part of Grand Lodges, many of whom are very, very resistant to that kind of thing. Yeah. And I don't know how long that's going to take. I'm curious, were you, were you open about your interest in the esoteric and the magical when you first joined the craft, or did you get any pushback from the, the old-timers? No, from... I didn't. No, I, did, I didn't. Uh, nobody asked. <laughs> I just I, I explained that I had met you know I, I knew Masons th- this Mason and that Mason and um, that I had been impressed by them and I was interested in joining the craft and we had the usual pro forma sort of discussions where they made sure that I was that I was a person of good character or just perhaps simply a character and <laughs> and they brought me in. and um, I have found that in most Masonic jurisdictions, one or another of the of the additional branches, um, the concordant bodies, or whatever they're calling them this week, um, that's where the occultists hang out. Yes, there are places I've been where it's the Scottish Rite. You join the Scottish Rite, and very quickly you find you figure out who's on the occult bus. Some places it's the York Rite. Some places it's it's one of the other bodies. You, you never know, but. Um, yeah. On the other hand, Seattle had at least one lodge that was pretty much entirely um, members of the Order Templi Orientis. Mm-hmm. They had joined. They they decided they wanted to get involved in masonry. They joined a lodge that was mostly defunct. They uh, Grand Lodge kept a wary eye on them, but as long as they didn't bring any Alistair Crowley into the lodge, they were fine. So. Yeah. No, that's that's great. I'm I'm actually a member of Scottish Rite as well, and and I tend to agree uh-huh. with you. the The degrees are. Absolutely beautiful. There's so much potential there, but mm-hmm. you know, not not to disparage it at all. But I just think that you know, there's so much more that could be done with that with that it, work. I I wish they could. I wish they would go back to doing the degrees one at a time, yeah. to doing the degree like you know, so and have people spend some time between the degrees. Yes. Yeah. Maybe to, even have the four the four subsidiary bodies of the Scottish Rite meet separately. Mm-hmm. Put on the degrees separately, and, and don't do the theatrical kind of thing. Do it like a lodge. Yeah, 
Yeah, it's a little yeah. better up here in Canada where I am. Um, it took us uh, about yeah. two years to get through the entire, you know, 32 mm-hmm. degrees. But Cool. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, that, that's I'm really glad to hear that. Mm-hmm. Um, so often here, I mean, I, I went through my original um, Scottish Rite degrees in Seattle in, in a weekend. Mm-hmm. And yeah. it was, I was impressed, but there was a lot I didn't get. Yeah. And fortunately, there are some there are some bodies now that that actually I mean because all they do is the mandatory degrees. There are many many valleys. There all they do is the five mandatory degrees. Yeah, and yeah. that's sad because there's so many other, there's so much richness in there. Yeah. Please remember, we're in the midst of our meditations on the tarot study circle that is open to all Chamber of Reflection paid members. In August, we'll be meeting to discuss the chariot. And you should join us. In the second half of our interview, available to members at ChamberOfReflection.com and our Patreon, John Michael Greer delves even deeper into civilizational decline in its various manifestations. Join us for that compelling conversation. And I'd like to remind you that although you're able to listen to this podcast at no charge, it costs time and money to create. We ask you to support our efforts in the creation of future podcasts by joining the membership section at chamberofreflection.com or subscribing via Patreon at patreon.com slash occult of personality. As always, if you're already supporting the show or have done so in the past, my heartfelt thanks and I salute you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 